So let me get started. Thank you so much for inviting me. This has been a wonderful day and opportunity. I see a lot of beautiful people in the audience, everyone from different ethnicities, race, class, genders, sexuality. Thank you for coming to this particular presentation. As I was introduced, I'm uh, Dr. Brandeis Marshall. I always put the doctor in front of my name because I worked hard for it. <laughs> Um, all of my background is in computer science, but please know that I am someone that sits and tries to better understand every single discipline. So I like the humanities, I like the social science, I like the arts, I used to dance as a child. So if you want me to do a pirouette, keep waiting. <laughs> I did that when I was six, I'm not doing it now. Well, let me get started by talking about the status quo. And the status quo is, I think, what everyone here already knows. I did a little bit of research before doing this talk. And I said, OK, let me look at the most common Python libraries. How many Pythonises are in the house? OK, so we got, OK, R people. Got a couple of R. OK. Um, everybody else? Nothing at all. I like those people too. So I, I happen to be a Pythonista, so I like Python. So I looked at the top five Python packages or libraries, and here they are up on the screen. So of course everyone knows pandas, numpy, scipy, seaborn, and of course matplotlib. But of these top five, I decided to dig a little bit deeper, and I mean just a tiny bit deeper, and that was looking at who was contributing to these particular libraries. And as you all might know, these particular libraries are all open source. So because they're all open source, I wanted to have a better idea of the diversity of who was actually creating these packages. So what you might see, I'm gonna reference gender, so male and female. Only. I know that there's many other sexualities, but I just did male and female. So here we go. I did a little Python code for the Pythonistas in the house. For those that don't know what this is, this is just a little bit of a dictionary in Python, which essentially is just being able to store a label, and that label happens to be the Python package. That's what's in the first quotes. And then, of course, inside of the curly brackets is now disseminating out how many men and how many women of the top five. So I chose the top five randomly of being, the, and then looked at the number of men and number of women, and of course assigned them an integer. And it took all the way till I get to, to the very last one till I actually see a woman. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Five packages in Python that is used globally Packages are created every single day. And who's creating it are mostly men. Everyone's face is like, oh my God, this is bad. And I would say, yes, it is. Because there's more than men who are using these packages. There's more than men who need to understand these packages. And there's more than men that need to contribute to these packages. So it looks a little bit like this. You like the poses? But that's people that are creating. But what about the other ones? When it comes to racial ethnicity, class, or even sexuality, how are those particularly different? Who is actually contributing to this package? And really, why is it important? So let me pause here for a second and tell you why it's really important. It's extremely important to have different perspectives not only for baseline ROI in business, but it's also good to understand the perspectives because there's certain cultures and certain norms within cultures that need to be part of and embedded into the fabric of all the technology that we create. And if the technology that we create is relegated to one particular gender or one particular class or one particular race, then we are now seeing only a sliver. And that particular sliver may not represent all of it. So as a data head for the past 20 some years, um, 
let me now show you a little bit of the data coming out of General Assembly from about two years ago. General Assembly provides a number of courses, and of course, we are now looking at only the data science piece based upon gender. This, of course, is also reported from those um, who, uh, who attended and took courses at a General Assembly. So we see in data science that 62.8% are men, 35% women. A little bit of an imbalance there based upon just general data assembly type of um, uh, learners, right? You see that it's more skewed, a little bit more skewed for women inside of data assembly, I mean inside of general assembly. And then the second bar chart there, data science looking at ethnicity or race. Vast majority happen to classify themselves as white. And then the second branch is Asian. And then the third branch is Latinx. And the little sliver at the end is black or African American. So even though I am inclusive of all marginalized groups, I find this to be very disproportionate and very disheartening. And unfortunately, this is one of the only, if not the only, reporting out when it comes to race and ethnicity when it comes to data science. So it's supposed to help everybody. But to us, it's supposed to help everybody, but everybody is not represented. So, another little Python, general coding right here, just the not equals. So now, of course, there is a charge. Because as an instructor, as an academic by training, as an education by nature, um, as a passionate, I care about the next generation and the current generation, I'm always trying to find a solution or at least dispense out some thoughts to possibly get to a solution. So about six months ago, I was looking, working on a data project, and I was very frustrated by the project. And that led me to, this, to do, actually do this tweet back in December. And the tweet essentially was like, OK, if we're going to do a data project, for this data project, we need to make sure that we look at several different principles. And I call it PAIR, participation, access, inclusion, and representation. We need all four inside of every single data project. Whether you're talking about machine learning, AI, um, are you considering deep learning, are you considering something else like storytelling? We need to look at these four. So I'm going to dive a bit deeper to each one of these and really talk about the different phases. So I think there's three phases that every organization needs to go through. And the very first one is the audit. So hopefully this resonates with all of those in the house who are part of the business um, discipline. So when it comes to the audit, the audit is inclusive of understand each one of these principles in a way that's really posing questions to do an inventory. So for each one of these four, I'm posing two sets of questions. And I'm doing this because there is not only a human element, but there's also a tech element. One can't be without the other. I know they like to stay separate, but I'm bringing them together. So on human resource, the question is, who is sitting at the table? Literally, who is sitting at the table? And what do they look like? What is their lived experience? Is it all one brain, or is there divergent thoughts? On the tech side, who actually uses the products? So are the people, are the clients, are the customers from different backgrounds and lived experiences, and how is that information captured? Access, on the human side, who grants access to the products? Is it easily downloadable? Is it mobile friendly? Right. These are some of the follow-up questions. 
On the tech side, how is data used? Are you collecting data just to collect the data and house it somewhere, or do you actually possess dormant data? And that dormant data, data that is just sitting somewhere being archived, when you hear about a company that happens to be breached, nine times out of 10, it's dormant data that they've grabbed because no one's looking at it, no one's monitoring it. So why did the company collect it? And what is it gonna be used for in the future? Inclusion. On the human side, who is being listened to? When you're sitting at that decision table, what voices are being heard? What decisions are being made? And who are making those decisions? What's their background? What's their lived experience? I have been in many a room where I have set an idea to be completely ignored. I have a PhD in computer science, and I'm completely ignored. But a white man says it, and it's the best idea since the sliced bread. That is part of my lived experience. So I've gotten accustomed to sometimes leaning into the white man next to me and saying the idea and getting his allyship and then saying my idea in front of the group for him to then champion it with me. Sobering, isn't it? On the tech side, how are marginalized groups considered in the development phase of that particular technology? Most companies and groups think about how is this technology going to be optimized, but no one thinks about the use of that technology and who's going to use it, and how who uses it might actually impact how it's designed. In representation, who is overrepresented? The question is always, is there underrepresented minorities? But I'm flipping that on its head to say who is overrepresented. Because I'm not under anything, and I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a minority of nothing. I'm part of a marginalized group. I'm not an underrepresented minority. But who is overrepresented? Are there more men in the space than women? Are there more people who happen to be African American versus Caucasian? That's important to note for your organization during your audit. And then for representation when it comes to tech, how are marginalized groups considered in product implementation? This is the testing phase. Not just the dev phase, but actually the testing, the deployment phase. Who is actually looking at the product and providing that feedback, and are you listening to that particular feedback? So that's the audit, the inventory. And ironically and intentionally, I made it so these are really numbers that you can gather when you're doing the audit. So phase two happens to be the implementation. So now that you have some baseline, now let's move on to how you're going to possibly make some changes. In participation, I'm looking at workforce development as well as tech betterment in each one of these principles. Now I want to pause here for a second as you read this particular slide because I think it's extremely important to see how I worded this narrative. I talked about human resource when it came to the audit because that's what it is, it's staffing. But when it comes to the implementation, it's about looking at what is happening inside your own organization. And that is really workforce development. That's the existing individuals and anyone new that you're bringing into the space. How are you upskilling them? How are you now evolving them into newer, different, more broad aspects? So again, I ask who's sitting at the table? How are you moving that dial, making it more inclusive, making it more equitable? And then when it comes to the tech side, how do you actually implement responsible participation? 
Responsible participation is almost like a code of conduct. How are you inviting people into your products? Is it racialized? Is it gendered in some way? Is it elitist in some way? Right. People that have tens of thousands of dollars are the only ones that can have access to it are some of the questions that you might want to think about how you might want to re-implement your particular products. When it comes to access, now the question is all about opportunity. So within your organization, who is given opportunities and how are they extended? There's this notion of nepotism that does happen. It is our human nature. That's a little bit of psychology that I've learned along the way. <laughs> but how do you rail against that? How do you deal with the fact that a black person is going to enter into your organization and they're going to have a black voice? And how are you going to be welcoming in that particular space? When it comes on the tech side, now the question becomes, how can products serve more people? Your stakeholders are very broadly defined. Your clients, the people that might be backing you funding-wise, any new clients that you might actually have. But how are you now changing the access for them? Or what are you looking at changing as far as access for them? Now, when it comes to inclusion on the workforce development side, this is a very tricky one. This is where certain passions of mine exist. Because I believe education needs to be inclusive. And how we do that, we haven't quite figured out. Because I don't think we've really talked about how to make education inclusive. So let me give a very concrete example, given my years in computer science. Every computer science textbook that I've had has been written by a white man. Never saw myself as part of the educational continuum or invited into the space. Because every single time I have a textbook and it's not written by anyone that looks like me. Ever. Been a couple of women, but pretty much no one that looks like me. So how is that bringing into the workforce of having that consistent message of you don't see anybody that looks like you disseminating the information, creating the content. But the message has to be very clear that examples, data sets, algorithms, looking at biases, fairness, I have a whole separate conversation about fairness. I don't particularly like the word. But how are we now going to ensure the content that's given to employees, to college students, to community college students, to high school students, to elementary school students, is one where they see, can see themselves represented in positive ways, and possibly not so positive ways, to give it some balance. So that's really a struggle that we have in the education system. And far as tech betterment inside of inclusion, the question is the same from the audit. How are you now changing policies, practices, protocols, or procedures in order to include more input and hearing what people of marginalized groups might be thinking when it comes to your design? It's necessary in the design phase. And then it comes to representation. In workforce development, now who is overrepresented? Have you taken this little formula and swung it too far over to the left or to the right and not quite gotten center? So go, a bit, go again and look at your numbers. Who is at that table? who might be overrepresented, and how do you evolve that particular conversation. And then there is tech betterment. 
and the question from the audit remains the same. When it comes to a marginalized group, how are they included in the implementation? Just because you included them in the design phase does not mean you included them in the implementation phase, because things can change. And of course, the marginalized groups are just as diverse as anything else in the world. So you want to make sure that you are expansive, you want to make sure that you reach out and do it in ways that is very genuine. Because a transactional type of relationship a marginalized person like myself will see a mile away. I, oh, you just want to check a couple boxes. You really don't want a partner. You just want to check boxes so you look good. But a genuine relationship that will take years in the making and give decades of impact is what is interesting, is what is necessary at this juncture. And then step three is to re repeat steps one and two about every five to six months. And I gave five or six months because every year is too long. Every year is like, oh, I'm just doing an oil check. But every six months, it's like it's on your brain for a little longer. It's necessary to continue to ask yourselves questions, ask your group questions, ask yourself questions about how are you now navigating this space. How are you including more people that maybe don't look like you, maybe don't think like you, but that you take what they have as a contribution and incorporating it into the culture of the organization? So there's always what's next. So I talk a lot about race, class, gender, broad anticipation within data science. And of course, you all know I'm an educator by training. So of course, the next steps <laughs> is you gotta do some work. <laughs> so you have to invest in involving. So what I think what is absolutely necessary is that you never stop learning. Never, ever stop learning. Data science demands it, and to be inclusive in data science demands it. So I actually have six recommendations. A couple of them are available um, on the um, bookshelf out, out front. But let me go through each one of these very, very briefly. So the very first one, these are all alphabetical, no other organization here. The first one is W.E.B. Du Bois' Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America. Anyone heard of it? A couple of people. So now this is definitely a reading for everyone. So W.E.B. Du Bois, from the late 1800s, early 1900s, very prominent African American who believed in the talented 10th, something that I really don't agree with, but he, he, that's what he presented. He did a number of infographics about African Americans, white people, particularly in Georgia. He taught at Clark Atlanta now. It was Clark College at the time. And each of his infographics, which was done by hand, they put it in a book, and they've written stories and narrative around every single one. It is absolutely fascinating, so I highly suggest you get this particular book. It, would, it is full and rich of wonderful colors, as well as wonderful commentary about social justice, injustice, and interesting details about what happened in the late 1800s in the Georgia area. Second is Ruha Benjamin, Race After Technology. This book is on pre-order. I'm still waiting for mine. <laughs> and it is really talking about the, the new gym code and looking at how technology and race are intermingled and how certain types of tech can be very racialized and how that might be perpetuated. Third is a short, very short document, something you don't have to buy, something that you can download at racialliteracy.tech. It's a 10-page conversation starter just about racial literacy within technology.
Next up is automated inequality. How many people have heard of automated inequality? A couple of people, a couple more, okay. If you do not have this book, I highly suggest you get this one too. This is a conversation about classism in the United States, about poor houses, and how, the, how us as a nation have relegated people of poor means to the fringes. And then she also talks about how poorness has been automated and the challenges with those. Fifth is Dr. Noble's work, Algorithms of Oppression. How many people heard of Algorithms of Oppression? A couple folks. A couple more people, Algorithms of Oppression. It is one of the best-selling books in the past year or so. This talks about the racialization and sexualization of African-American girls and other marginalized groups within the Google platform. And Google is not a search engine, it is a media company. So read this book, you're gonna get a very big dose of reality of what happens inside of search engines and how they operate and how they promote popularity rather than promoting credibility. So it's a very interesting perspective. But last but certainly not least is Dr. Roth's book, Who Gets, um, Who Gets What and Why? Anyone heard of this book? One, per one person, one you right there, but a little person. Okay, one person. This is a book. Um, <laughs> Dr. Roth is a Nobel laureate in economics. He got this Nobel laureate with two other people based upon market design. So anyone impacted by diabetes in your family or yourselves? Just want a couple of people in the room. Where his work with his collaborators looked at kidney transplant chains. And his algorithm is the foundation of that. What that means when one person donates the kidney and then another person donates the kidney, before you know it, you have a chain of people that donate kidneys so that, of course, the person originally that needed the kidney gets an actual kidney. And he also looks at school systems and charter school selection criteria. Very interesting books, all very eclectic, and they're all meant to be eclectic because that is what data science demands, that's what inclusivity actually is. The architecture is quite simple, is that people have to start making changes within themselves to then for make changes within organizations so that now technology can change and just get a little bit better in what it's doing. I truly believe it's all possible I wanna thank you for your time and your attention. Please follow me on social media. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm here for the rest of the day. I would love to continue the conversation and how your organization can do a little bit better when it comes to inclusivity. Thank you very much.